arrange my windows appropriately. Okay, are we ready to get going? Uh, maybe give me a second. I'll go ahead and uh, I'll start our own recording. And then I'll, I guess I'll just point my laptop I, at the screen. I'm going to go a little bit to the board. <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll rotate my laptop. Uh, uh, sure. Jeff's not projecting using go to meeting. I don't know how this yeah, is. I'm recording. Uh, so, so um, since I found this paper on BioArchive, and um, I have this paper it's relevant to some of the work, uh, two of the authors, Subita reminded me that we spoke to them a few years ago. <laughs> so Subita has been in touch with me. Uh, she got to play and I guess, uh, and then with T and Brown. So um, this is the paper. Yeah, this is a not a public paper. It's by archive. It's a link I in chat for it. Chatting with Subutai. So I think he submitted it, and he said probably. But then I, I point out that the very last, the very last uh, sentence in this uh, paper is this right here. It says, uh, "Wait, a where is this?" Oh, this is probably methods section. Oh, that's the methods section. Yeah. Okay. Right here, the very last line of the paper is XXX site other relatives for <laughs> So it, it, it suggested that perhaps they didn't, they haven't submitted it yet, but maybe they have. Yeah, I know what paper they're talking about there, though, the Bell Life Art one. Maybe, but it's, it's just not in a format, yeah. you know. So yeah. XXX is, I guess, a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a this is not an easy paper to read. Uh, there's a lot of details in it. Um, they do summarize it, but it's still difficult to sort of constantly remember what the summary is. So let me just give you the big picture here. Big picture, they, uh, what's the good thing about it is they're trying to understand the effect of layer six on other layers um, in predictive model. Okay, that sounds pretty close to our world. Um, it's not as close as you think, uh, partly because they're, they're really restricted in many ways and they what they can do. So it's ambitious what they're doing, but it's also pretty far from what, uh, uh, our idea. So for example, in the predictive model, they talk right from the very beginning here, you know, the very first line in the abstract, the predictive model can enhance, well, and then it says, can enhance the saliency of unanticipated input. So the, the best side. way they can test the predictive model here is by giving repetitive stimulus and then modifying it. Um, you know, so you have like, you know, blah, 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 but that's the thing. The two paradigms they're using, they're all in RAT, they're all in uh, the somatocentric cortex, S1, with whiskers. One uh, paradigm that they're studying is represented by these, this figure here. And this is a, a, an experiment where the rat is on, like, it has to walk across this gap. And because there's a water reward on the other side, and so the rat has to figure out how far across it is by stretching its snout and feeling with its whiskers. And, um, and they do, they do something here. In this case, what they're doing now is they're going to be optogenetically activating layer six cells while they're doing this test. And they're going to optogenetically uh, break that into two this is the one he's talking a about. weak stimulus input and a strong one. So they're going to weakly activate layer six and they're going to strongly activate layer six. And they just, there's some limit to which they say that. And does, so does this happen in the dark? Uh, I guess like so. the, the, yeah, I guess so. You have to get the mouse can't see. How yeah, they did. They had they talked about um, the, the, making sure the mouse can't see here. Well, they, they specifically said they wanted to make sure the mouse can't hear the, what's going on. Well, like you'll see in the moment they're changing, they're going to change this the distance the second ledges while the rat's feeling it, and they want to make sure the rat can't hear that or feel the air movement. Mm. So they did, so I'm assuming it's in the dark um, because otherwise the rat could see it, I guess. Um, well, I, I don't know. But anyway, this the, the, the experimental result is the following. Um, so they have this strong signal and a weak signal, again, optogenetically modifying layer six. And for example, in this particular case, they say, oh, well, if we if we strongly activate layer six, which just means some random amount of energy out of a laser greater than two milliwatts, then the performance of the rat crossing the gap is reduced. So this is an area here where they're activating layer six, and the rat is less likely to make it across than here over here where they're, they're not activating layer six, and that makes it across better. So I can't really tell what he's pointing to. Performance to like the 60 uh, percent performance of crossing the 
the gap. And then here's, I'm not going to go through, this is, these figures get really complicated. Um, this one here, the rat, right there. what they're now they're trying to do, this is just like, hey, what happens if I activate layer six? Uh, and then here they're saying, um, what if we, the rat is now detecting a change, so while the rat is feeling the other side, uh, they suddenly move it. <laughs> um, so it's a change detection. And they're trying to see what kind of signals they get reading out of other layer of neurons during the change detection. Uh, and then they do that while activating layer six again. So the bottom, the, I, I'm, I'm going to jump to some summary things in a moment because the summaries are simpler than the details. Um, they're basically experimenting with different levels of activation of layer six under different tasks. The other task that they use um, is one where they just uh, they they just take a mouse that's in a head fix paradigm and they they wiggle the the whiskers themselves and they can do a change in the strength of the wiggling the whiskers themselves and then they and then in that case they're using um, both optogenetic uh, readout and um, uh, this uh, implanted probe um, so they got to give you some cells. Um, and they try to differentiate different types of cells. So those are the two paradigms. One, they're both somatosensory, both change detection. One is a, 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 a behavioral paradigm, the rats moving and they're just stimulating us while they're seeing what's happening. And the other is they've got probes in the brain of the rat and optogenetic, and they can actually try to beat out individual cells or population of the cells while they manually deflect and, uh, and change the, 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 the Okay? That's the basic idea that you got that. Um, and then they're trying to figure out what the effects are on other cells. So, yeah, I think I've mentioned all that. So they can look at the difference between an active and a passive paradigm. So in one case, the rat is actively yeah. initiating motor commands. They're, not, they're not looking at it that way. They're basically saying, hey, if we want to record from the neurons, I have to do the head fix. And, okay. and, and so they're saying, here's a behavioral paradigm I can manipulate that uh, layer six, but I can't record from the cells. And here, if I want to record from the cells, I'm going to try something similar um, where we're deflecting. But yes, there is a difference. That's, that you, that's a few difference. It is a big difference. In fact, well, the whole thing here is, I mean, we, we are, you know, we say layer six is a very sophisticated signal. Um, and it's representing uh, some combination of location and orientation. And, uh, and it's going to be very specific for very specific type of things. Here, they're just doing change to them, deviance to them. It's a very simple predictive model. It's basically saying, you know, you've got a repetitive cycle pattern and change. Uh, which is not clear at all what our models can do with that. I don't think we've ever talked about that in terms of like, we don't think of that as a model of the world. That's a temporary, um, uh, temporary thing. It's not a permanent part of the world. Um, and these rats haven't really, you know, they just get acclimated to the signal for this one experiment and then they, they do it. So it's a very different way of looking at layer six. And, um, and the effects that they're detecting are, are very sort of simple effects as well um, when they look at the other cells. So there's, a, there's a still a huge gap. Although they're sort of talking about predictive models, what layer six is doing to these other layers, what they actually, in the end, what they can detect and measure is pretty simple. Uh, then we can do the experiments for simple things, it's complicated. Um, so, just change the future, it seems like in that first experiment, we're just saying whether they can coerce the rat to jump, keep your mind. Well, they're not coercing the rat, the rat wants to jump. So, they do, they, 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 it's not just change detection, but they're trying to, um, that's really what the paper's all about, but you're right, in that first experiment, what they did is say, hey, just what, what happens when we just, you know, manipulate layer six. And so they made some observations about that. Um, so um, maybe I can just, they've summarized just multiple places in the paper. Maybe I can. The chart you showed where it showed the uptake in attempted crossing during up to the It wasn't an uptake during attempt. attempt. No. The, the rat's attempting to cross, and it doesn't do it as well. It, it be, so when you, when you strongly, when you basically blast layer six, it doesn't perform as well. Now, that's done on its own tell you a lot, right? You know, it's, you know, you're just going to go in and start injecting, you know, activity in some part of the brain, you know, probably it's not going to perform as well. So in this case, you know, the rat's just trying to decide, can you get across? It's, 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 
he wants to get over there because there's water reward. And the first thing they do is say, hey, what happens if we just strongly activate this? And they get that part of them to show that when they weakly activate it, it doesn't happen. Okay, so they're saying there's a threshold above which I can make the rat perform poorly, and now we're going to talk about the, the threshold below that where the rat still performs it. Um, but what happens? And you follow what I'm saying? So the basic conclusion of this experiment and, and the other ones too, one of these conclusions is the following. If you weakly activate layer six, it, um, um, it doesn't change the overall performance of the animal in the, under the change detection scenario. Um, it's sort of like when you weakly activate layer six, the animal, the animal loses its ability to determine the deviation. This is the conclusion. The animal loses its ability to determine the deviation. Um, so in the case where the, the little thing is moving, if you're weakly activating um, layer six while that thing was moving, it's as if the rat doesn't notice it. And the rat just goes ahead as normal. But if you strongly activate it, it disrupts behavior. So that was sort of like saying, okay, we're just now focused on the weak paradigm, which doesn't dis disrupt behavior, but it does disrupt change detection. That's the, I think, so you might think of this as a control look. You're like, hey, yeah, well, there are some, some signals that will really mess things up. We're going to go below that. It doesn't mess things up. And that's what's going on down here. Um, I, I really don't want to get into all the details of these things. Here. So do you see this as a decision making task or a, a performance of any uh, performance? You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a decision. Like, I, the rat's trying to get across. There's water the, on the other side. He wants to get across. What if the puppy was too far? The decision would be a Yeah, yeah, but he's not deciding what to do. He's just saying, can I do this thing? And um, I don't know. I'm not even sure. I forget. You know. I mean, are there even cases where the rat does not even try? And it uh, sounds like it's more. Deciding how strongly should I push yeah, my legs or jump across or something. Yeah, I think that's that. Um, it's just going to go across. The it, they're not doing it as a decision making task. They're just trying to see that can I disrupt behavior and what happens when I do this to disrupt behavior. Uh, this one here, this second one now, uh, what they're showing here is this is showing here under that when you give the, um, the mild. Uh, um, uh, Layer six activation, so that's it's less than one milliwatt activation here. That it removes the um, uh, the effect of the moving platform. So normally, if the rat detects the moving platform, it, it doesn't. It, it's a like, hey, wait a second, I don't want to jump right now, right? And so, but when they when they mildly activate layer six, it, that performance difference goes away, um, and the rat just says it's like it doesn't even notice it. That's what this one shows. Um, uh, motion, or do we, do we take this motion, or do we take that or on that? Because when we get reviewing a paper, disrupts, mm -hmm. um, so again, uh, the, the motion detection is easier to detect than uh, distance. Uh, no, that's not what they're taking away from here. Uh, the weak activation was able to disrupt. Uh, what they're saying the weak activation disrupts is the deviance detection, and it's not saying. Uh, I don't think they're talking about different distances. That has to go back to the, I forget whether there were sections of this trial that I couldn't jump across. Um, the paper really just focused on deviance detection. This is what the paper's about. Okay. Um, and weak activation is enough to disrupt deviance detection. Yes, so they're saying, ah, when I, I'm smart, uh, when I, and I, I, I'll just jump to one of the other conclusions they made throughout the paper. It's really a hard paper to read. But, uh, and I'm not faulting the authors for that. It's just a lot of detail in there. Um, one of the things they showed was that when you weakly activate layer six, um, the actual cell population changes in layer six. Um, different cells activate. It's a sparse pattern and different cells activate. And um, that's all they can say about that. And, um, and, that, and then for whatever reason, that leads to a lack of the animal detecting um, um, the, uh, the deviance. And they showed that in layer four and layer two, three, two, I believe that's, that's a, the idea there. So um, let me just go on. You, you can see right here this um, um, 
I think I just told you about here, says showing that selectively abolished change detection with little effect on sensory and motor function. So, um, um, so they're saying when you when you weakly activate uh, layer six, it's selectively abolished change detection. Okay, but, but not static detection. Right? I'm trying to remember what I just said. That's just saying. Um, uh, you know what's going on. Here. So that's uh, with a weak activation, it does not. Yeah, it seems like that scratch should have been with the previous condition. Uh, really, there's a lot in this paper, but we shouldn't get too hung up on this. Huh? Yeah. 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 The static is more robust than the deviation. It's the ability to perceive the, the static locations is harder to disrupt. It requires more than just weak activation to disrupt the static detection, whereas the deviation is. It's, it's harder to do the moving platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which in some ways is surprising because we're so sensitive to motion. But that, uh, it, it might not be. Uh, this is not the motion sensitive, right? Yeah, it's, it's not detecting whether it's sensitive to motion, it's detecting whether the rat is successful at jumping. So the rat has a different thing. Well, rats risk active So the, the rats, there's a constantly changing signal coming in. So it's like the constant changing signal as they do this. And yet now it's it's a deviance detection, not a change. And you can call it change, but it's not like there's a static input on the, on some sensor and then it changes. There's a dynamic input from the sensor, and then the nature of the dynamic input changes. Um, um, I mean, there throughout this paper there are so many little caveats in every single result. You just really got to just you know just just every little one like well it could be this could be that with this but you know. So though it's being boxed in all over the place here, so it's kind of hard to reach any kind of sweeping conclusion. This is the introduction of the second um, experimental paradigm. Uh, weak depolarization of laser neurons change the identity of stimulus driven ensemble. Basically, they say different cells activate without changing the mean mind firing rates across layers. So basically they're looking at mean firing rates and all the other layers, and when they activate layer six, it changed what it was doing, but the mean firing rates were the same everywhere. And this is this they this they determined by doing this test road um, recording, uh, and they're you know of course they have to they have to distinguish between regular spiking neurons which are like, like cytosine neurons and fast spiking neurons which determine the same inhibitory neurons. Lots and lots of detail here which I really don't want to get into. Um, again. Um, um, then down here, it's like they're showing, hey, strong layer six activation, decreased firing rates, and reduced sensory gain at other levels, as in the visual cortex. Um, but the low power ones did not change uh, mean sensory both firing rate if any of the regular spiking neurons in any layer, and small, fast spiking firing rates change were observed only in layer, I mean, you know, only in layer six fast spiking, but not sensor responsive. I mean, it's literally, it's, it's layers and layers and layers of, of um, Stuff in <laughs> that uh, you know. So you, when you start having a sentence like this, low power optimal drive not change mean sensory growth firing rate in the regular spiking in any layer, and small fast spiking firing change which was in only layer six fast spiking neurons that were not sensory responsive, because some were. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just goes, ooh, it just gets on and on. So it's hard to generalize too much from this. Stuff. There are some summaries we'll get to on one. Um, this whole chapter, this whole thing here basically is saying it's difficult to target layer six <laughs> neurons. Um, uh, they're just talking about some of the. Um, yeah. I'm not uh, I want to get to the summary. I, I don't think the summaries have too many implications for us. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff for the summary. Uh, this is one of the few papers where I find the figures are actually harder to follow than the text. Um, and uh, so I actually, after a while, I just stopped looking for figures. The first two were not so bad, and then after that, they got pretty. That's just kind of like just spending too much time. Um, you can sort of just summarize it here. Small variations in stimulus amplitude in layer six were not robustly encoded in layer four and layer two three. Okay, so you know they like, modified layer six a little bit, and they didn't see any changes. Okay. Um, to identify that the cause of the change of behavior is happening because of the change in layer six. They're just yeah. trying to tease apart what layer six might be doing impacting these other things under the system. There isn't really a sort of a, a big long-term 
hypothesis or testing here. It's more like, hey, we have a, let's see what happens when we do this. Let's see what happens. <laughs> type of thing. Um, I mean, in general, people know so little about their sex and behaving. It's just like it's a very few experiments at all that do anything like this. So I think they're just doing very, very basic this stuff just because they can see a difference. Right. So here's a, I mean, really, I don't think it's worth, you know, you can disagree, you can, you can read the paper. But my my report back here, there's this, this observation here, but it was very difficult for me to look at some of these observations and go, oh, that's an important idea. I need to remember that, which is often I get from the paper. Um, so, you know, but there's lots of little details in here, like layer four neurons, when they uh, encode stimulus deviations, that's like the, the change in the frequency or vibrating thing. Uh, they can change the frequency and the amplitude of the vibration of the, of the thing. Uh, they then decide, then they said there are positive color change coefficients and negative change coefficients. So when you when you make a stronger deviation, does the neuron go stronger or does it go less? Uh, so it's a positive versus negative change coefficient. And they said, okay, the letter four neurons encode stimulus deviations uh, with positive change coefficients. So, all right, so if you increase the vibrating, layer four increases. Right? Not too surprising. Um, and then he said that layer four neurons consistently show positive can. You know, try more spikes in case of the future. Skip the figure again. I'm going to do that. My prerogative. Um, then they made a distinction down here with layer two, three neurons um, uh, explicitly encoded stimulus amplitude deviation. So they're just, they're, what are the, how are layer two, three neurons behaving differently than layer four neurons during these? during uh, these changes, you know? Um, so we can say here, as in layer four, so some these two now have nothing to do with layer six. They're just on their yes. own. Well, uh, yes. So are they repeating previous experiments? This seems like kind of odd to put this. Um, or are these control well, studies? Or do, they go back and then they, do they go back and then show I'm sure it? this sort of stuff must have been. Um, yeah, but not necessarily. I think what they're doing here, then they're going to go, are we going to go back to layer six again? Is this sort of basic response properties um, of layer four and layer two T cells. I'm one second. I'm sorry, I don't remember this. It's really hard to keep this all in my head here. Um, Change it. Um, I'm not sure this stuff was observed. I'm not sure this stuff was observed. There's nothing about layer six at all. This is yeah, just yeah, layer four yeah, yeah. and layer three responses. Back, they might be bringing back layer six later. Just here, in summary, in some layer four neurons encode deviant. deviant amplitude reflected in a positive correlation between the rates in the direction of amplitude change. In contrast, layer two three neurons showed a variety of responses to deviants with different receptor fields for different specific items of baseline deviant. In contrast, the prior reports, so this is what they're doing. Here's, here's the distinction. In contrast, the prior reports increased neocortical excitability with, each, with stimulus shooting deviations. Neither population showed significantly increased overall rates of amplitude small, for small amplitude deviants. I mean, these are subtle changes. So they're saying in the past, people showed that when you had a deviant, you had increased rates of activity. Now they're saying, hey, for small deviations, you don't get overall increased rates, you get some subtle firing more and some subtle firing less, and things like that. I mean, it's just really hard to, to me to know what to do with this. Um, so if I don't know what to do with that, I kind of like it runs into one eye and not the other. Um, um, so now we're doing the same thing for layer six cells. Um, and um, so they're saying a weak, well, let me put it in here again. Um, it's really, you know, it's a little thing. I thought it was so highlighted. Um, and then what do you see? Let's go down the sum again. Sum. Um, okay. In sum, both the identity of the sensory driven ensemble and the amplitude decoding by letter six, now that we're distinguishing cortical thalamic cells, by the way was disrupted by weak optogenetic drive. Uh, despite the no change, no change in the net activity of the neurons. I'm trying to remember what this means now. That's just a hard paper to parse. Um, 
The identity of the sensory driven ensemble. Um, okay, so when you have a weak input, uh, when, you, when you modify um, um, uh, but when you modify this weakly, the layer, so you're not even doing the oxygenetic variation in the, in the layer six cells, back to that again. Um, what, what you basically said, there was no net activity increase. So there's a number of cells active learning. But the identity, meaning the, the population and the amplitude of those cells was disrupted. So again, now you have a weak stimulus to layer six, you're deflecting the, the, um, um, the, the, the whiskers, and you've got a change in population in layer six, but you know the overall activity is the same, and no contrasting to other people. So I, again, I'm sorry that I'm not summarizing this well because it's very hard for me to put in some sort of framework so I can understand what the point of all is. Um, and that's the bottom line for me. Is that something that layer six removing the DBF encoding, or is that just slightly higher up? This year. Uh, yeah, that one. It's covered in the summary later. Yeah. Okay. If you want to read it, go ahead. We next examine whether we got the drive layers that can have the stimulus representation of the layers. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, that's in the summary, but we go through it right here. So now we're saying, okay, we can we got this optogenetic manipulation of layer six. What happens in other layers? Um, uh, so now they're doing the change. So again, they're doing the man manual manipulation, and then they do Thanks the Thanks for the kind words, Cartel. The change representation in layer two, three, that's the deviant representation, was disrupted. Um, uh, it was disrupted. If they lose their prediction in NX, they're just doing representation of current studies. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. During optogenetic drive, layer two, three neurons can represent current stimulus amplitudes with positive change coefficients and reduce their history dependence, meaning they're, they, they, they stop representing, as you said, Jim, stop representing the sort of change deviance. They just sort of acted that was just whatever the stimulus is. Context -free. Yeah, so again, they're kind of sure that layer six represents this context, but again, it's a context of just a repeated signal and then a change as opposed to any kind of deeper context of so um, the so I don't know how to, again, I'm going to put that into our models. When they activate layer six, they're not activating specific cells of the, it's just like a blast. No, this, well, it's, it's optogenetic and I think they can, they can target layer six CT cells. Right, but it, it, within the CT cell population, it's not like they're being very precise about no, it. It's just no, like they're no. on or off. Yeah. And how much. How but well they are at least targeting CT cells. Yeah. So. But in, that, in which case, it's surprising that they're not seeing that increase in population activity. They're just blasting activity. Well, this is a weak, remember, this is weak yeah. one. And, and it's not too surprising. I mean, imagine if you're you just, there's a lot of inhibitory cells yeah. that are just trying to keep the sparsity the same. Yeah. Imagine, well, what if it was just like a uh, one of our, um, um, you know, gradient fields there? I mean, it's just like, you just, there's a bump and, and you might move the bump, you know, but it's not going to form two bumps or three bumps unless you really blast it, then the whole thing goes screwed up. So they're basically saying they can suddenly change which cells are active um, in that continuous track group type of thing, but that's what it is. Um, but so that's not too surprising. You know, the system wants to keep a certain level of sparsity and you're just sort of tweaking it somehow. Uh, so it gets in set of cells and then parsing them. Um, so basically that they're, they're one of the big conclusions here is when you when you weakly um, Modulate layer six, its ability to do deviance detection goes away. And then, therefore, the deviance encoding, um, uh, what was it? Remove deviance encoding. And layer, yeah, so basically, you're saying if layer six is the pro provider of deviance encoding to layer two, three, then when you remove it in layer six, layer two, three no longer shows deviance encoding. Okay? So that's kind of suggesting layer six, and they do the same thing for layer four. Uh, and layer five, um, they did do that. I can't read Anyway, they talk about layer four versus layer five. And so the big conclusion is that layer six is representing is required for this deviance detection, and by by small activation of it, you can 
uh, disrupts that deviance detection. Uh, and, they, and they show that in the two experimental paradigms. And so that's at least consistent with our, at that level of. Yeah, but it's pretty, it's pretty far removed from. Yeah. I mean, sort of yeah. object detection. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's really, I don't even know how our model would represent something like a deviance detection where you have a repetitive signal and then it changes. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what would happen there. Um, it's hard to say what's layer six representing at that point in time. You know, they're just going to be. They made a point here, another thing that they did in this paper, somewhere they make the point here that these experiments have been done primarily in the past with like audio. And if you use audio, there's a lot of pre-processing going on. So some of this deviance detection could have been pre pre-cortical. Um, here they're using S1 as more direct. So they're saying, ah, we're showing you the results um, uh, for S1. Uh, where other people have shown other things. Oh, uh, um, let me just go to the discussion here. Um, let's see what I want to say about this. Um, They were making a distinction here between um, layer four and layer um, six versus layer two, three. Um, uh, so this manipulation also removed uh, the encoding of stimulus sequence in layer two, three. Um, oh, here's one, one just lost. I lost that one. Point out this one. No, in contrast, here we go. In contrast, heterogeneous encoding. Um, and encoding stimulus history emerging layer two three neurons. Small layer, small stimulus amplitude is correlated to positive prime rates in layer four and layer six. The TV amplitude increases during driving high prime rates. In contrast, uh, um, heterogeneous encoding. So layer two three cells show both positive and negative correlations with the deviance. So I had so uh, if I had a reduced signal strength, layer three compete would say, ah, some cells are fired more actively than, and if they had increased ones, other layer 3 cells were more actively, but that wasn't true in layer 4 and layer 6, where they seem to be correlated uh, only positively. Again, what do I make of this? I don't know. <laughs> um, so then down here, um, Let's see here in this area. Basically, they're arguing that the, 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 the inter, um, intervention, being the weak activation of the six, isolated a network mechanism or, or computation that selectively involves stimulus change processing, but not processing of repeating or predictable stimuli. Um, so the failure of the weak layer six activations impact baseline behavior in contrast to several findings uh, showing that relatively subtle um, optogenetic mutation in S1, for example, in use They're basically saying layer six seems to be this 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 deviant detector. And there's different um, and then here's oh here's the one it's a study is essentially uh, deviation typical manipulated features such as tone pitch, which are pre-portable turning neurons. I already talked about that. And one of the goals is specifically to not do that, to isolate this. Um, then down here, what do they say? That's the the mechanisms by which activity specific ensembles of layer six cells influence the state of stimulus encoding in superficial layers. That's our proposals here. So, what is layer six doing? The upper layers are still large and known. It could also mediate through a variety of intermediate cell types, layers, and brain areas that are not recorded in the present experiment. Well, you know, so it's like anything could be happening here. Well, the present results directly support a specific role for layer six in the behavioral benefit of deviance. In the representation of devi de uh, deviation across neocortical layers, further studies required to determine the circuits and activity of cellular mechanisms by which layer six is kept known. So it's a very, you know, it's a sort of a, what can you do with that conclusion? Um, uh, you know, they're focusing on deviance, which is really a, a, a weak part of the predictive models. 
And I highlighted this paragraph here. It's, not, it's all in the discussion section. Um, this finding suggests that a sparse ensemble of active layers on layer six with specific connectivity is required for deviance encoding. So, okay, that's sort of along our lines too, right? Um, there's a sparse population of layer six um, required for deviance encoding. We don't focus on that. Um, and then they said there's two ways this can happen. The specific population of layer six cells active during optogenetic drive was different from one active during control conditions. And so this changing of layer six uh, could lead to a disruption of stimulus in layer two, three, um, because and this is how we would say it, because a new set of active neurons would be decoded differently by the recipient link. So if you can change the layer two, three is protecting the layer four, and you change the population in layer two, three, then you've got to change. In addition, we found that population of layer six CT cells that is active during optogenetic drive carries less stimulus information than the population is active in the control condition. I think what this means. Um, suggesting why it might have changed. Okay. Um, so I, I, I really, I'm not going to go into more detail, but I just couldn't really get much more out of it. Um, but there's lots of papers like this where you can just spend hours and hours and hours trying to read through the data. But for me personally, when I read a paper like this, I'm looking for some insights. And I'm just constantly on the, on the radar for like something jumps out and says, oh, that's interesting, interesting results. I didn't know that, I didn't expect that. I didn't find that too much here. I mean, there's a lot of things we didn't know, but they didn't seem to, to really clearly relate to our work in a way that I could say, aha, that's really teaches me something. I even looked at the references they had for the circuitry that, that's underlying this, which they didn't talk about much, and it's all the same old papers that we've read. So there really wasn't anything new there. It wasn't like, oh, there's some new data about the anatomy here that they're basing on. They don't really talk about the anatomy at all, but they did have references to them. And so there wasn't anything new there. So uh, it looks like people just haven't been really working on their sites much. So I hope, I hope that was okay. It may be less satisfying than some of you have asked deeper questions than I. Um, but I just couldn't find deeper insights uh, for me. It's one of the reasons that uh, we have less evidence from layer 6 because it's difficult to optogenetically. Not optogenetic, it was, well, it is difficult optogenetically, but even before then, it was difficult going along back with just any kind of probe, throw it in the upper layers. Right. Um, then you would be clear where you were. Right. And then optogenetically, it's also true. So now they're starting to get techniques to optogenetically do things. Um, so they have various methods of both observing layer six cells um, from above and from the side and manipulating them, you know, specifically. Um, so, you know, they're able to target layer six CT cells for optogenic manipulation, which is pretty impressive. They had to get a, you know, a mouse line where that, you know, the, the relevant cells, only the relevant cells were infected. CT cells as a marker. Well, it's a, they have to have a virus that only infects those CT cells. And you have a virus that only infects those CT cells, then you get that marker in the CT cells. And you can, uh, it means those cells are genetically Yeah, genetically. Yeah, well, yeah. that's almost certainly the case. Yeah, all of these cells are have some genetic. Yeah, you can determine some other difference between them. There's, there's going to be a genetic difference. That's assumption, I guess. Um, in the line all this, for the list, why would they be different? <laughs> Somewhere along the line, they said, I'm going to. Grow a little differently. I'm going to do physiology. I'm going to connect some places some myself. Um, so and so the you know huge amount of effort goes. You can see right there that they talk about these you know these three lines here. You know these very specific. Um, in fact, that might be right there. Uh, this is referring to right uh, We apply selective optogenetic equalization in layer like six and mice, expressing channel adoption in layer six corticolamic chromosomes, cells, and that was this particular line of mouse that you can. Acquire <laughs> that you do that practice. I think that's what that is. Mm -hmm. My understanding in order to develop the pre line, you have to identify the specific genes in our first. Someone else has already done that. We have some, we have these diseases, but not all. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no. So if you look at the Allen Institute, for example, they have the exhaustive genetic database of. The but that doesn't mean there's a pre line for each one. It doesn't mean there's an outside for all these things, right? I think there's some cell types that you still can't differentiate genetically. No, I think. exactly what the uh, is that true? I mean, you're, are you just assuming that, or is it? Uh, I think that I've read that, that we don't have, we don't have three for every particular cell type in the 
Uh, I actually yeah, yeah, no. yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, Jeff was saying, knowing the genetic differences versus having a pre is there's an additional step. You gotta have, you gotta have a virus that, that yeah. works. You know? yeah. I mean, the whole thing is crazily complicated. I mean, it's amazing. You know, you get these viruses that infect only some cells and they inject these, you know, this material into the cells without killing them. And, you know, it's just amazing. And I think once you inject it, you have to wait a while until it, it takes a yeah. It's like a couple of weeks or something, yeah. several days. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the breath. Well, yeah, that's true. So, you know, I guess maybe there's a little, uh, I, I, I don't need to be disappointing because I don't want to imply disappointment what they did. It's just, it's, it's, it's just point is that there's still a long way to go between what's technically possible in an experimental lab and the kind of work we are doing. Um, so if this is sort of representing the state of the art and these techniques, it's, you know, it's just, it's just hard. You know, if you want to have a behavioral experiment, experiment, okay, so you, know, as long as you can never ask the rat, hey, what do you think this is? You know, you have to come up with some test where they're thirsty or hungry and they're going to do something different based on it. And so, like, you know, so there's a limited number of things you can do. Um, and so, you know, really it's, um, I don't know how they go about it. You know, it's interesting to think about when the rat, um, we've seen those movies, the rat reaches out and grabs a piece of food, right? You know, with a lot of dexterous movement to pick up a bunch of piece of food. You know, somehow the rat's recognizing something. You can have the rat recognize different types of food and then see, you know, what cell the rat did during that recognition visually. Yeah, I don't know. Um, anyway. So, anything that's my report. Thank you, Thank you for what's right. I spent two hours on this. I didn't want to spend the time to really, really get through it. Yeah, a lot of time. But I tried to do this last week, and after I spent a couple hours on it, I got this explained so far. You know, and then, so that was part of me getting through it. That's that. Okay. The mission to see, I'd love to see what happens with this, when this paper gets published. Um, um, it, it was, I felt it was, you know, at first I didn't realize it was a, it was an unpublished paper, at first I started reading it, and it really felt like there's just a, like a laundry list of stuff going on here, and I'm wondering, I was, wow, this is really, it's an unusual paper, um, and I just wonder, if, you know, it, uh, after you go through the review and editing, where, you know, will it be, so, will it be somehow clear, um, um, you know, will it be, will it be forced to focus down on it? There's a lot of stuff in here. There's a huge, you know, um, extra section on experimental methods, supplement results, and so on. All right, that's it for me. Okay. Anything else from anyone? All right. Yeah. Right. 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 I mean, I'm working on it now. I guess the big thing here is like people being out and like an next come and uh, mm -hmm. them being out on Wednesday. Yeah, I make sense. Maybe we should wait. Maybe by Monday then. Well, sure, if you, I mean, you're not here Monday. I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll